Welcome to Lesson 11C, Navier-Stokes Solutions Cylindrical Coordinates. In this lesson, we'll write out the components of the continuity and Navier-Stokes equations in both Cartesian and cylindrical coordinates. I'll show you an alternate form of the viscous terms in one of the components of the Navier-Stokes equation. And I'll do a famous example problem, fully developed laminar pipe flow. Let's look at continuity and Navier-Stokes in vector form. The vector forms are valid for any coordinate system. Here I show the compressible form of the continuity equation, but we're going to talk about incompressible flow. This is the incompressible form of the continuity equation in vector form. Similarly, we'll limit our discussion to the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation, which is given here in vector form. Later on, we'll also talk about the vorticity, which we introduced in an earlier lesson. Its vector form is given by this equation. Zeta is del cross u. I summarize all the equations in Cartesian coordinates, again for incompressible flow. This is continuity. This is the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is the linear momentum equation. Similarly, we have the y component and the z component. Here's some other useful equations. The Laplacian operator, which you can see here. In this case, it's del squared w. And in our vector form, we have del squared of v vector. The continuity equation is a scalar equation, so there's just one. The Navier-Stokes equation is a vector equation, and we split it into three components. We see this v dot del term in the Navier-Stokes equation. I expand that out in Cartesian coordinates here. And finally, these are the vorticity components, zeta x, zeta y, and zeta z. Now let's do a very similar thing with cylindrical coordinates. We'll use r theta z as our coordinate system, and u r u theta u z as the corresponding velocity components. Again, we have continuity, the r component of the Navier-Stokes equation, the theta component, and the z component. Notice that we get some extra terms, like a u theta squared over r, u r u theta over r, u theta over r squared, etc. Where do these terms come from? Well, at some point in the flow, the unit vector in the radial direction is er, and the unit vector in the theta direction is e theta. But if you change theta, e theta changes direction, and so does er. Notice that er is pointing this way here, but this way at a different point. Likewise, e theta changes direction. So you can think of it as some crosstalk between these two equations. Since these vectors are changing, they affect each other, and these extra terms arise. Again, I list some other useful equations. The Laplacian, this v dot del term in the Navier-Stokes equation, and the components of the vorticity vector, zeta r, zeta theta, and zeta z. As I said, these equations will come in handy later. Before I do an example, I want to talk about an alternate form of the viscous term in the theta component of the Navier-Stokes equation. What I did was take this Laplacian operator and plug it into the theta component of Navier-Stokes in this term, and just expand it out. And the viscous terms now include all of these terms. Sometimes we'll solve problems directly with this version of the equation, but there's an alternate form. We combine these two terms. We use the product rule to split this term up. Then we use the inverse product rule to combine these terms. After a little bit of algebra, these two terms can be written as del del r, 1 over r, del del r of r u theta. So these viscous terms can be written alternately as this term, which includes these two, and then the other three. So all these terms within the green box can be written as these terms instead. Why would we do this? Well, it turns out in some problems it's easier to use this form of the equation than this form. And in some problems it's better to use this form. So you take your pick, depending on the problem you're solving. Now we're ready to do an example problem in cylindrical coordinates. We'll do fully developed laminar flow in a round pipe. We've talked about this many times already. And now we'll generate an expression for the velocity profile. We'll be able to do this analytically. We have a fluid of density rho, viscosity mu, in a smooth round pipe of inner radius r. We're interested only in the fully developed region, where we know that the pressure decreases linearly with distance x downstream. In this problem, by convention, we use x and u instead of z and uz for the flow direction. In fluid mechanics, we typically like x to be the direction of the flow, even though these equations here were set up in terms of uz and z. 
everywhere we have a z, we change it to an x. And everywhere we have a uz, we change it to a u. So let's do our step-by-step -step procedure that we learned in an earlier lesson to solve for this flow. I list all the steps here. Step one is to identify the flow geometry and the flow domain. We take a section of the pipe of radius r, and our flow domain goes from x1 to x2. x is the coordinate in the flow direction. Flow is from left to right, and r is the distance from the center line. At x1, the pressure is p1, and at x2, the pressure is p2. So del p del x in the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation is p2 minus p1 over x2 minus x1. And this is a constant since the flow is fully developed. In fact, x1 and x2 can be anywhere along the pipe as long as this flow is fully developed. And del p del x is just a drop in pressure as we move down the pipe. Step two is to list all the assumptions and approximations. As I said previously, it's good to number your assumptions and approximations. Number one, the pipe is very long in the x direction which allows us to make the fully developed approximation. The flow is steady. The radial component of velocity is zero. There's flow only in the x direction. The fluid is incompressible and Newtonian with constant properties, for example, density and viscosity and laminar. It turns out that we're not able to do this kind of a problem with turbulent flow. We can't get an analytical solution, but we will generate an analytical solution for laminar flow. Number five, we have a constant pressure gradient in the x direction, as we already discussed here. The flow is axisymmetric about the x-axis, and there's no swirl. This means that nothing is changing in the theta direction, and u theta is zero. There's no swirl. Del del theta of anything equals zero, and u theta equals zero. We ignore gravity in this problem. Step three is to write out all the differential equations and simplify them as much as possible. The reason why I like to number my approximations and assumptions is that we now apply these to these equations and put the number underneath each term that I cross off. This one goes away by approximation 3, this one by 6, so del u del x is 0. This is our continuity equation. The r momentum equation is treated next. We know that u r is 0, by assumption 3, so everywhere there's a ur, it goes away. Again, 6 tells us that u theta is 0. We're ignoring gravity. ur is 0 by 3, and if u theta is 0 by assumption 6, then del u theta del theta is also 0. In fact, del del theta of anything is 0. Now consider theta momentum. These terms all go away because of assumption 6. Nothing is a function of theta. We're ignoring gravity u theta is zero, and del del theta of anything is zero. Now consider the x-momentum equation in the direction of the flow down the pipe. This flow is steady, assumption two, u r is zero by assumption three, u theta is zero. This term is not zero in general, but notice from continuity that del u del x is zero. So that term goes away because of continuity. We have to keep the pressure term in, but there's no gravity and I'll expand this term. When we apply the Laplacian, we get these three terms, so the two circled blue terms are the same. Well, again, nothing is a function of theta, and del u del x is zero, again, by continuity. If del u del x is zero, then del squared u del x squared is also zero. I'll put this term on the left, and the pressure term on the right, and I divide by mu. But let's think about these partial derivatives. U is not a function of time since this flow is steady, it's not a function of theta, since this flow is axisymmetric, and it's not a function of x, since it's fully developed. In fact, u is u of r only, so we can turn these dels into d's, total derivatives. That will make our life a lot easier. Similarly, p is not a function of time, or theta, or r. p equal p of x only. So similarly, we change these partial derivatives into total derivatives. So our x-momentum equation reduces to these two terms. Let's go back and look at our r-momentum equation. We had this one term left. Everything else went to zero. So the only way this equation is satisfied is if del p del r equals zero. So we've actually used that here, saying that pressure is not a function of r. Now let's specify our boundary conditions for this simplified equation. It's second order in u, so we need two boundary conditions for u at some r. 
at r equal r, which is the pipe wall, we know that u equals zero by the no-slip condition. And at r equals zero, u has to be a maximum since the flow is actually symmetric about the center line of the pipe. Mathematically, we write du dr equals zero at r equals zero. Those are our two boundary conditions. And for the purposes of this problem, we'll assume that dp dx is a known constant. It's constant because pressure decreases linearly down the pipe. We also need one boundary condition for pressure at some x location. The actual value of pressure at some x is arbitrary, however, since we're going to specify this slope. And we'll just keep dp dx as a constant in our evaluation. Now we come to step four, which is to solve the differential equation. I'll rewrite this equation up here, and then we'll solve it. First, let's move this r over to the right. Now we can integrate. We get r du dr. And since dp dx and mu are constants, integration gives us r squared over 2 times the constants. And we add some arbitrary constant c1 as a constant of integration. In this step, we multiplied by r. Since we had an r in the denominator, now we have an r in the numerator. So we divide both sides by r. Now we can integrate again. Again, everything's constant here except the r. So we get r squared over 4 mu dp dx. This gives us c1 natural log of r plus another constant c2. This is our velocity profile for u of r, but we need to find these constants. That's where step five comes in, applying the boundary conditions. One of our boundary conditions was that at r equals zero, du dr equals zero. Let's apply that boundary condition to this equation. Otherwise, we end up with a one over r and r going to zero, which is infinity. For this boundary condition, both r and du dr are zero. So we have zero equal, r squared is zero, so that's zero plus c1. So c1 is zero. That gets rid of this term. Then we have the no slip condition at r equal r. Let's apply that to this equation. Zero equal capital R squared over four mu dp dx plus c2, since this term has gone away. Thus c2 is negative r squared over four mu dp dx. And then u becomes this, and we can combine the two terms to get our final expression. This is a paraboloid, which means that the velocity profile is parabolic in the xr plane. And a paraboloid is when you rotate 180 degrees around to get a three-dimensional profile called a paraboloid. So this is our famous velocity profile for fully developed laminar pipe flow. And it's written in terms of this constant dp dx, the pressure drop, which is negative, by the way, since pressure is decreasing with x. But this is also negative, which gives us a positive view. Step six is to verify the results. I'll leave it to the viewer to do this on your own. Namely, we can verify that all the equations and boundary conditions are satisfied. So this is a valid solution. Finally, step seven is to calculate other properties of interest. For example, u max is u at r equals zero. And from our equation, we substitute r equals zero here. We get u max is negative r squared over four mu dp dx. We can also calculate the volume flow rate. We do that by integrating theta from zero to two pi and integrating from r equals zero to capital R of u times r dr d theta. Again, we plug in our u from up here without going through all the algebra. We get v dot is minus pi r to the fourth over eight mu dp dx. Again, this is a positive term because dp dx is negative. Then we can calculate the average speed, which is what we always use for calculation of Reynolds number. We just take v dot and divide by pi r squared. So average speed is negative r squared over eight mu dp dx. Finally, let's calculate the shear stress tau, which is actually tau rx, which equals tau xr. It turns out that the deviatoric stress tensor in cylindrical coordinates is written with these nine components in the r theta x coordinate system. But with all our assumptions and approximations, all of these go to zero except these two. And those two are mu du dr since this tensor is symmetric. So the shear stress is mu du dr, which we can get by taking the derivative of our velocity profile. And when we do the math, it simplifies to r over two dp dx at the wall.
From here you can calculate the Darcy friction factor F as a function of Reynolds number. If you do it right, you should get our old friend F equals 64 over Reynolds number. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.